Dr. Samantha Holden. She is a board certified neurologist and the medical director of the University of Colorado Neurobehavior and Memory Disorders Clinic. She is the co-director of the University of Colorado Lewy Body Dementia Association Research Center of Excellence. She completed her med medical degree at Stony Brook University and residency at Rush. She then completed a fellowship in movement disorders and then behavioral neurology here at the University of Colorado. And she will be speaking to you all today about the Lewy body dementias. The slides are in here yet? Do I just, oh, that's still busy. There we go, great. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for sticking it out to the very end. Uh, this is my first talk in person since before COVID. So it's very, <laughs> I've done a lot of talks, but mostly to myself on a screen and not knowing who was behind it. So it's so nice to have this be the first one with such a special group and to see so many familiar faces in the audience. So my job today is to review or introduce the broader category of the Lewy body dementias, plural, because there's two of them. And probably the most common question that I get in our memory disorders clinic, number one, is what's the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's? And we'll review that. But then the second most common question I get is, well, what's the difference between Lewy body dementia, dementia with Lewy bodies, Lewy body disease, Parkinson's disease? You know, how do we keep all of this terminology and semantics straight? so that we can give people and their families the most accurate diagnoses, that we can treat them as appropriately as possible and eventually come up with better disease modifying treatments by putting the right people into the right types of trials. So stop me at any time. We don't have that much to get through in terms of actual bulk of this talk. So we can certainly have it be more interactive if you'd like. But as we go through these things, just keep the broader picture of Lewy body dementia as an umbrella. So talking about thinking and memory and changes through our lifespan, it's a spectrum. I always put normal in quotes, as I did on this slide, because there's no such thing as normal. We're all special and different and unique. And there's much more of a spectrum of what our brains are capable of doing and how our brains work. And the idea of neurodiversity is really becoming more accepted and the norm, where even if somebody's brain works a little bit differently, doesn't mean that it's wrong or a disease per se. So what's normal for any one person is what's normal for them. And there are ways our brains work that are more common, the middle of that bell curve, but there's always people out on the tails. That doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong. It might just be different. So when we're thinking about what's normal cognition, Cognition is just the term for thinking and memory, our brain processes that are higher order functioning. We have to couch that in what's normal for that person, not what's normal for me, not what's normal for their neighbor or our family member, what's normal for them. How has their brain worked through their lifespan? So for any of us, as we get older, the things that change that are expected, walking into the kitchen and forgetting what you went in there for, normal. There's actually something very specific about doorways and archways where our brain hits a little bit of a reset button. And that's probably evolutionarily developed so that when we moved into a new environment, we scanned that environment and said, am I safe? Is anything in here gonna eat me? Do I need to fight anything off? So it kind of hit that reset to say, okay, this is a new environment. I've got to start over. So that's normal. 
forgetting the name of that guy. You know, the guy that was in the thing with the hair? Normal. There is nothing about proper names that is a single purpose of a brain area. The fact that my name is Samantha is meaningless. My parents liked that name. There was a TV show in the late 70s and early 80s with Nell Carter. She was a nanny. One of the kids' name was Samantha. My mom liked it. It wasn't bewitched. That's what I get asked a lot. So you have to remember ah, the woman, short, dark hair, the neurologist, New York accent. That's Samantha. So you have to make several connections there. And as we get older, the speed of those synaptic connections slows down a little bit. They're still there. The cells are there. The connections are there. But the speed of processing slows a bit. And that's the tip of the tongue. It's like, I know. I know your face. I have an idea. I have a concept of this. What's the name again? And then when you're driving home, you go, oh, that was Samantha. Oh, geez. Now I'm embarrassed. That's normal. Okay. There are some things that get better our whole lives. Our general wisdom and knowledge, our ability to recognize patterns improves our whole lives. But the speed of processing, proper names, walking into the kitchen, forgetting what you went in there for, not necessarily anything to worry about. If it is not a consistent, prominent pattern of forgetfulness, and it's not affecting your day-to-day -day life. That's the threshold for something that's not normal. So the next step up in a spectrum of changes in cognition is what we term mild cognitive impairment, or MCI. Mild, it's not so bad. Cognitive, thinking and memory. Impairment, there's some trouble. It's a relatively newer term, about 20 years ago or so. It used to be, well, you're normal or you have dementia. We know that there is, again, a much broader spectrum of changes and what's normal. But mild cognitive impairment can be diagnosed if there are noticeable changes, a decline in the level of previous abilities. It's noticeable either to the person or to people that know them well. When we do formal thinking and memory testing, draw on the clock, remember the five words, there's some trouble. But the level of trouble the person's experiencing is not yet affecting their daily independence. Complicated things like paying bills, managing medications, driving, it might take more effort or compensation techniques like lists or alarms or reminders, but the person can do those things. That's mild cognitive impairment. What pushes somebody over into a category of dementia is that there are noticeable or bothersome changes in thinking and memory, and now it is affecting that person's independence starting with complicated things like paying their bills or managing their medications, but could progress to needing help with more basic things like getting dressed, bathing, eating. That is all dementia means. A decline in the previous level of thinking and memory abilities from their baseline that's affecting their day-to-day -day function. So the only difference between mild cognitive impairment and dementia is how much it's affecting their independence. None of these terms are specific to a certain disease process, nor are these diseases in and of themselves. They just describe that level of difficulty. This is relatively easy to categorize based on getting to know the person, hearing the story from people who know them well. I always worry when somebody comes into our memory clinic by themselves, so it means I'm only getting half the story. The inside view 
of their brain. And that's not our fault. We live inside of our brain. We can only see the inside view. So getting that outside view, which is often a different opinion, neither is right or wrong. They're just different perspectives. But telling if somebody's had a change, figuring out how it's affecting their day-to-day -day life is relatively easy. The harder question often is figuring out why. Why is this happening? What's going on in this person's brain and or body and or environment that's causing these changes? So just looking at it a different way with a time course here in terms of how these changes can occur for any one person over their lifespan. Not everybody goes through all of the stages of cognitive decline. Sometimes people just make it into a mild cognitive impairment stage and they stay there. If everything else is being well taken care of, if they take really good care of their bodies, they work out, they eat a Mediterranean diet, they don't take Prevagen, don't take Prevagen, I agree with Dr. Kluger, useless. Some people, if we find a reason for it, they have untreated sleep apnea. They have a vitamin deficiency. They're depressed. We find a reason that's treatable. We fix it and they can go back to normal. But for some people who have a progressive neurodegenerative condition that affects their thinking and memory, they will over time progress through the stages the speed, very variable, but as more parts of the brain get affected over time, there can be more difficulty day to day. So back to that umbrella of dementia, not a specific disease, a broad category. It's become pejorative, it's an insult. All dementia means though, going back to the basics and using the term correctly, is that a person has experienced a decline in their previous level of thinking and memory that is affecting their day-to-day -day life and independence. That's all it means. But when we think about the diseases coming from the brain itself that aren't outside factors in the body or in the environment, but those progressive conditions that we don't fully understand how or why they're happening so that we're having trouble stopping that brain cell loss. The four main categories of brain-caused dementia. Alzheimer's is the most common cause of a brain form of dementia, but it only accounts for about 60% of the cases. And so that question I get in my clinic of, well, what's the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's? Aren't they the same? Dementia is the category. Alzheimer's is just one kind. Meaning that if we looked at the brain under a microscope, we would see amyloid plaques and tau tangles inside the brain, primarily short-term memory loss and difficulty with orientation to place and time at first, but there's actually three non-memory forms of Alzheimer's, which are very frequently missed and misdiagnosed. One where people have vision changes called posterior cortical atrophy. One where they have more behavior and personality changes called dis-executive or frontal Alzheimer's. And one where they have a lot more word finding difficulty and language problems called logopenic primary progressive aphasia. There will not be a quiz at the end, more just to let you know there are non-memory forms of Alzheimer's. But still, all of those forms of Alzheimer's account for about 60% of the cases of dementia. The second most common is vascular dementia. This can be from multiple strokes that were obvious and somebody had symptoms from during their life but it can also be more insidious and quiet, decreased blood flow through hardened or narrowed blood vessels in the brain over a long period of time. 
More common if people have risk factors like heart disease, blood pressure problems, cholesterol, diabetes, if they're smokers. And we can see these blood vessel changes and resulting damage in the brain on brain scans. It is very common that people have some Alzheimer's, some vascular changes, but it's becoming less common as people take better care of themselves, as they're eating right, they're exercising, there's less smoking, people are taking care of their blood pressure and blood sugar and cholesterol. Now, the third most common overall is the Lewy body dementia is our focus today. It's a broad range of prevalence, estimated about 10 to 25% of the cases of dementia. But this is where we're going to focus today in terms of how we use these terms, how we make these diagnoses, how we separate it from things like Alzheimer's, and then also some newer treatments and clinical trials on the horizon specifically for Lewy body dementia, because almost everything we use is borrowed from Alzheimer's and Lewy body is not Alzheimer's. We need our own things. The least common form of dementia, thankfully, is frontotemporal dementia or FTD, accounts for about 10 to 15% of cases. I say thankfully because this can be very, a very difficult form of dementia to deal with where people are typically younger even in their 40s and 50s, they have young families, they're working, and it causes such significant behavioral and personality changes that it is so disruptive and difficult for people. And then in terms of how do you take care of people long-term who are younger, healthier, but have this very severe dementia, memory care is not gonna cut it, right? So this can lead to very difficult social and psychological situations. So as I alluded to at the beginning, the word Louis gets thrown in all over the place when we're talking about not only Parkinson's, but the related forms of dementia. Dr. Louis was an Austrian neuropathologist in the 1930s who escaped Nazi occupation, but was the first to stain brain pieces in a very specific way that showed these little bubbles inside the brain cells. And I don't know if he put his own name on it or if somebody else put his name on it, but they became known as Louis bodies. You can only see them under a microscope with this special stain. And inside of these little bubbles is the misfolded sticky alpha-synuclein. We all have alpha-synuclein, we all have synuclein in our bodies, but in some people it gets sticky, it clumps up, the brain cells can't get rid of it, so they stick a little bubble around it, and I'll worry about that later, but then it can't get rid of that bubble. It probably induces inflammation and other changes in the brain, the brain cells can't do their work, they start to die. So a lot of work in understanding all of the Lewy body diseases has focused on that alpha-synuclein protein. Can we get rid of it? Can we decrease its after effects? So Lewy body diseases is, again, the broader umbrella where if we looked at the brain under a microscope, we would see Lewy bodies. But it is a category in which Parkinson's disease and the Lewy body dementias exist. The Lewy body dementias includes both Parkinson's disease dementia and dementia with Lewy bodies. Now, are Lewy body dementia and dementia with Lewy bodies used interchangeably? Yes, sometimes even by my colleagues in the field, which leads to a lot of confusion because then those people living with Parkinson's disease 
and cognitive impairment do not feel included in the Lewy body dementia research or advocacy. So we'll talk about how we use these terms correctly, as well as what it means for prognosis and treatment and really importantly, future research. But the only difference between Parkinson's disease dementia and dementia with Lewy bodies is what came first. If somebody had slowness, stiffness, shakiness for at least one year, then develop dementia, that is categorized as Parkinson's disease dementia. Why one year? Totally arbitrary. If thinking and memory trouble came first or at the same time as the slowness, stiffness, or shakiness, that is categorized as dementia with Lewy bodies. There is no other difference. The symptoms are the same. Some things are more common in one versus the other. Sometimes what bothers the person or their families is different or the things we are bothered enough by to treat with medications. But the conditions are on much more of a spectrum with some overlap than two completely separate diseases. In practicality, people who go to the doctor or come to our center here because they're bothered by their tremor or their walking and balance and end up in the movement disorders clinic are probably gonna have Parkinson's. As opposed to the people who are more bothered or their loved ones are more bothered by thinking memory, behavior changes, and end up in my memory clinic in Central Park, they're probably gonna have dementia with Lewy bodies. So what's more prominent? What's more bothersome? What led them to seek medical care is more helpful in determining which category the person fits into than trying to look back in hindsight and say, well, maybe my tremor started in 2014 and then maybe I had a little memory trouble late. Like that's impossible to do, right? So the only time I diagnose Parkinson's disease dementia is where the person's been diagnosed with Parkinson's. They've seen a movement, hopefully a movement disorder specialist, got a diagnosis of Parkinson's. Their thinking and memory was tested, which it should be once a year at least. And they were normal, normal. Then later in their disease course, usually years later, they develop dementia. That's Parkinson's disease dementia. As opposed to those more wishy-washy cases where it's like, oh, it kind of came at the same time. I can't remember which, but both things are really bothering me or my memory bothers me much more. That's going to be dementia with Lewy bodies. The number of people that come to my clinic 10 years into their diagnosis of Parkinson's, sometimes 15, 20, and either they or their family members learn about dementia with Lewy bodies. And they come in and they say, well, were we misdiagnosed? Is it actually Lewy body and it wasn't Parkinson's? And that's what I want to avoid with these kind of talks, right? Where it's much more of that spectrum of disease and changes. We cannot fully separate them out. It's not a misdiagnosis. People with Parkinson's will get changes in thinking and memory about 80% of the time, but it depends when. Was it the first thing or did it come later on? Does that make sense? This is probably the most important slide in the whole talk. <laughs> okay. Now, just to make things a little bit more complicated, there's also this concept of bradyphrenia in Parkinson's, slow thought in Latin. So just like there's the bradykinesia, the slowed movement, there can be slowed thought. 
everything's connected and happening like it should be in there, just takes longer. And this is different from that spectrum of mild cognitive impairment and dementia. It's not on that same time course. This is separate. It's not cognitive impairment. It's just slow. And so I always train our students and our residents and our fellows that when you're testing thinking and memory and somebody with Parkinson's, you better give them time. Don't be moving on to the next one right away. Because often when you give people enough time, they get there, they get the right answer. And we never want to put labels on people incorrectly because we did the test wrong. I saw somebody a couple of weeks ago who was diagnosed with severe Parkinson's dementia. I did a MOCA, a Montreal Cognitive Assessment, your clock and your words and your animals. It took us 40 minutes, usually takes five to 10. He got a 25 out of 30. I just had to give him enough time. His cognition was normal for his age. He had very severe bradyhernia. Okay. Not on a spectrum of dementia. So when we're thinking about thinking and memory in people with Parkinson's, at the time people are diagnosed, when we do that cognitive screening at your first visit, up to a third of people have a little bit of trouble. They qualify technically as mild cognitive impairment. If you don't look for it though, because it may, might not be super bothersome for the person, you won't find it. And then another really important point when you're testing thinking and memory in people with Parkinson's, not only do you have to give them enough time, but you also have to be in tune with the motor functions responsible for memory testing. When we're asking people to draw or write or do things with their hands that requires fine dexterity, they might also appear like they have thinking and memory trouble, but it's their motor changes. The same with day-to-day -day function. If how we're separating mild cognitive impairment from dementia is how independent you are for your day-to-day -day tasks, but you're impaired day-to-day -day because of your stiffness or your slowness or your tremor, and then we say, well, they got dementia because they can't get dressed on their own. It's like, no, they can figure out how to get dressed. Their tremor impairs them from doing their buttons, right? So that degree of qualitative assessment of why somebody's having trouble, how are they having trouble, and being attuned to the contributions, not just from thinking and memory, but from the motor, movement, physical symptoms is also very important to be aware of. So if somebody does have mild cognitive impairment and Parkinson's, about 10% of those people each year will progress to dementia, meaning that there is trouble with day-to-day -day function, not because of their movement, but because of their thinking and memory. Importantly, we can decrease that risk of conversion by taking very good care of ourselves. I'm just gonna say over and over, exercise, exercise. Like have we said that enough today, exercise? I know the people in this room and online know that, but can't be said enough or understated enough. The miracle cure for all brain diseases, including decreasing our risk of dementia is aerobic exercise. If we could bottle that up and sell it like Prevagen, we'd be doing gangbusters. Exercise, exercise, exercise. It's free. Go for a walk. Now, if somebody has Parkinson's and they live long enough, about 80% will have some degree of dementia. Compared to other people their same age without Parkinson's, it's four to six times higher risk. So all the more reason to start as early as possible with all of those risk reduction strategies to keep that brain as healthy as possible for as long as possible. Exercise, Mediterranean diet, social stimulation, 
if there's any long-term consequence from the pandemic that I'm worried about is the degree of social isolation that everybody went through and how that's going to affect our brains long-term. It's very hard to make new friends after college, but getting out there, interacting with other people, meeting and learning about new people will do much more for your brain than crossword puzzles or Sudoku. We are social animals and loneliness and social isolation is worse for our health than smoking. So exercise, Mediterranean diet, social stimulation. Yes, you learn, use your brain and learn new things, but there is absolutely nothing about special about crossword puzzles. I want to know who was, who was the advertisers for crossword puzzles? Like, how did they get so popular? If you like them, great. But if it, they're so easy that it's kind of, you know, you're turning your brain off, learn something new. Any skill, craft, hobby, game, instrument, language, even if you don't get better at it at all, you might be the world's worst ukulele player, but the effort you put into trying to learn how to do it, if it's fun, if you hate it, move on, next thing. But there's nothing special about certain brain teasers or brain games or Lumosity or Sudoku. Learn new things. You get bonus points if you do it in a social environment. And you get bonus points if it's fun. Because then you'll continue it. Otherwise, mood and stress reduction overall. Five minutes of active rest a day is the absolute minimum where you're not sleeping, you're not zoning out in front of the TV, but something mindful where you're in the present moment, like you're pressing the reset button on the computer to let everything kind of calm down and reboot a little. We need it now more than ever. And don't watch the news right before you do it. My favorite thing to do is called five finger breathing. I sit, if it's nice, you know, on my front porch where I can feel the sun on my face or the breeze on my face. And I breathe in as I go up my thumb. I breathe out as I go down my thumb. I breathe in as I go up my index finger, out as I go down. Every single time I do that, I feel much better. If it didn't work the first hand, I'll do the second side. <laughs> I've never had to do more than two hands, but we all need that. You know, it's easy enough to tell people to meditate or, you know, do yoga, but every little bit of active, mindful rest strengthens your brain. Okay. And people always say, well, I tried meditation. I was terrible at it. Nobody's good at it. That's the point. It's a practice. <laughs> you have to keep doing it. And if you hated it that much and you couldn't wait for it to be over, you need it more than anybody else. So thinking and memory in anybody, any of us, but especially if you're living with Parkinson's, should be checked at least once a year. We do it in our clinics. You know, everybody, I think, has probably had the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. But... Sometimes in a busy visit, right, you got a bunch of other things you want to talk about or your doctor's running behind. We're trying. We're trying really hard. But sometimes it kind of slips through the cracks a little bit for any of us. There is a version of a thinking and memory screening test that you can do at home on your own. It's called the Self-Administered Gerocognitive Exam or the SAGE. It is free. It was developed at the Ohio State um, by Dr. Doug Shari, who's a wonderful dementia doctor. And it's very similar to what we do with you in the clinic, but you do it on your own at home. And then you can bring in the results to your next appointment and share with your doctor to talk about. And there's more research now showing that your scores on the SAGE test correspond very well with what your doctor does in the clinic. So there's a little uh, link there. It'll be in your slides. Or you can use um, the QR code if you put your phone up to the photo. It should pick that up 
and take you to a link there to the SAGE test. You can also Google SAGE. Based on those screening test results, we might order full neuropsychological assessment, which is like three to four hours of paper and pencil testing of all different parts of your thinking and memory. I always warn people, it's basically a stress test for your brain. If you went to your cardiologist and said, doc, it hurts, my chest hurts when I walk up the stairs, he's gonna have you walk on the treadmill till your chest hurts. So if you tell us, mm, I'm a little worried about my thinking and memory, we're gonna test your brain until your brain hurts. It's meant to be hard. If anybody walks out of neuropsychological testing feeling like they aced it, we did it wrong, or they're lacking insight into their level of performance. It's meant to be hard. It gives us, as clearly as we can get right now, how well your brain not only does under that stressful situation, but how you compare to other people your same age and level of education in not only memory, but executive functioning, multitasking, making decisions, judgment calls, shifting your attention, your attention, your ability to stay on task and focus, your language, both expressing and an understanding language, as well as your visual spatial functioning, which is navigation, understanding how things fit together. And in each of those domains, we have collated data from thousands of people at every age, at every level of education to say, this is what we would expect somebody with this background to do. And so it's our current gold standard, though it's still not perfect, to say, is this normal for age or not? We don't necessarily have to do that full four hour of testing. If everything else is going relatively well, if your screening tests look good, if we're not seeing a decline over time. But it's our most thorough way of testing somebody's cognition. So in those areas of thinking and memory, how do people with Parkinson's do? Usually memory is pretty good. So people with Parkinson's, even when they get dementia, do not look like people with Alzheimer's who might forget parts of their own life story or loved ones, usually starting with the most recent things and then moving back in time. That typically doesn't happen to people with Parkinson's or with Lewy body. And that's usually what people are most terrified of, right, is losing themselves. We don't see that as much in Parkinson's or Lewy body. What we see much more are changes in visuospatial function. Driving is a very visuospatial task, not only navigating from point A to point B, but where is my car in space? in relation to other cars and the lines on the road. And then executive function, also very important for driving, making decisions, shifting your attention. So that's why even if people with Parkinson's don't have a severe tremor or slowness, why driving can sometimes be a problem. And it's not that they're significantly cognitively impaired. It's that the parts of their brain responsible for making quick decisions and for navigating are also affected by the disease process. So people with Parkinson's typically have more trouble driving earlier than people even with Alzheimer's. Language, both expressing yourself and understanding what other people are saying to you is also usually pretty spared in Parkinson's. So shifting focus a bit from thinking and memory specifically in Parkinson's to its sister condition, dementia with Lewy bodies. Now remember Lewy body dementia is the broader umbrella that includes either Parkinson's disease dementia, you have Parkinson's, your memory declines years down the road. Dementia with Lewy bodies, is where that thinking and memory change is the primary, most bothersome, and or first problem. People with Parkinson's 
get diagnosed pretty quickly if they have a tremor, right? Everybody can see that. Usually, you can walk through an airport and kind of pick out tremors. I try not to do it. It drives my husband nuts if I start giving my cards out to people. But if something is obvious externally, usually you get to the doctor quicker, as opposed to something that's more internal and stigmatized, like thinking and memory, like neuropsychiatric or behavioral symptoms. So dementia with Lewy bodies is the most misdiagnosed form of dementia, and it takes the longest to get the diagnosis. Robin Williams, with all the fame and money and connections in the world, never got a right diagnosis of his dementia with Lewy bodies. His diagnosis was unfortunately on autopsy. Would that outcome have been different? I mean, you never want to play Monday morning quarterback, right? But if he had been counseled as to the other symptoms that come with dementia with Lewy bodies, as opposed to Parkinson's without dementia, would maybe that outcome have been different? So the most important thing is to be aware that it even exists as a first step. And Robin's case, as unfortunate as it was, has helped increase awareness. And his widow, Susan Schneider Williams, has really made it her life's mis mission since losing Robin eight years ago now to make sure what happened to him doesn't happen to anybody else. And it's part of the reason why I'm here today, right? To use this venue to partner with the Parkinson's community because we can achieve much more together than either of us could alone. So how do we diagnose dementia with Lewy bodies? So usually people are coming in worried about their thinking and memory, not as worried about a tremor or walking trouble that might be there, but it's not what brought them to the doctor usually. It's their thinking and memory. So to diagnose dementia with Lewy bodies, it's right there in the name, somebody has to have dementia. <laughs> Now, what about that mild cognitive impairment stage we just spent so much time discussing? There's no Lewy body mild cognitive impairment diagnosis that we can make right now. How do we define diseases? A bunch of smart nerds usually sit in a room and say, this is what I think the disease includes, and these are the tests for it. But those things change all the time. This definition of dementia with Lewy bodies changed in 2017, and it changed pretty drastically. Of course, people don't go from normal to having dementia overnight. There's a very usually protracted mild cognitive impairment stage, and we're completely missing it right now for dementia with Lewy bodies. But to diagnose DLB, the person must meet dementia criteria They've had a decline in their thinking and memory, and they are no longer fully independent because of it. The highest yield question I found to help figure out if somebody has dementia as opposed to mild cognitive impairment is usually asking their loved ones, if you had to be out of town for two weeks and they were home on their own, would you be worried about their safety or their ability to take care of themselves? for those two weeks from a thinking and memory standpoint, right? Not from a fall or tremor standpoint, but because of their thinking and memory. And some people who tell me, oh no, he's, you know, he did the taxes this year, or, you know, he drives, no problems. Then I ask that question and they're like, oh, but no. <laughs> it's like, okay, well, what's the truth here? And then if they say, well, maybe they'd be okay for a couple weeks if I was gone. Then my next question is, what if the hot water heater exploded? Would they be able to handle that on their own? And then it's like, oh, no, 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 right? So it's, it's all a matter of degrees. And because I don't go home and live with you for a few weeks to see what you're actually capable of doing, I kind of have to be a detective and dig through. But there must be dementia to diagnose dementia with Lewy bodies. Plus, 
two of these four things. The Parkinsonism looks like Parkinson's, slowness, stiffness, or shakiness. Visual hallucinations, usually well-formed people or animals. The REM sleep behavior disorder, the acting out of dreams. Or cognitive fluctuations, which are very significant ups and downs in the person's level of alertness, awareness, or attention. Now, we all fluctuate, right? We have good days, bad days. So if I ask somebody or their loved one, you know, do they seem to fluctuate? Yeah, we all do. So what's a better question when we're trying to detect fluctuations is, we all have good days and bad days. Does your loved one seem to have good minutes and bad minutes? And for those people with dementia with Lewy bodies, the loved ones and family members are usually like, how did you know that? I get whiplash trying to figure out what version of them I'm going to get at any given moment. So it's very dramatic. It's not good days, bad days. It is up and down all day. If we have two of these four things, sometimes we have three or four, but if we have at least two, we can say the person has probable dementia with Lewy bodies. I can never say definite without a piece of their brain under a microscope. I don't do that. Not while anybody would miss pieces of their brain. But most importantly, none of these four things are unique to dementia with Lewy bodies and can also happen in people with Parkinson's. So then we have to go back to what came first, what led them to seek medical attention, had they already been diagnosed with Parkinson's in the past? That's the differentiating factor. Okay. Questions about that? So the question was if you could pick up those bubbles, those Lewy bodies on MRIs. Not yet. Not yet. Um, we will often do an MRI to make sure there's not something else, like the blood vessel changes or changes in the memory centers that are much more characteristic of Alzheimer's. But the DAT scans, the dopamine transporter scans, are kind of an indirect way to tell me how much dopamine is in that person's brain. It doesn't directly relate to the Lewy bodies per se, but a person with dementia with Lewy bodies will often have a normal MRI, and if we need it, an abnormal DAT scan, where a person with Alzheimer's will have an abnormal MRI with shrinkage of their memory centers and a normal DAT scan. But the DAT scan does not distinguish Parkinson's from Lewy body. They look the same on the DAT scan. That's a good question. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So the question is really about the semantics, right? Where the diagnosis of Parkinson's versus Lewy body, it does not have sharp demarcations between them, where somebody can meet criteria for having Parkinson's disease and also meet criteria for having dementia with Lewy bodies. People with dementia with Lewy bodies can meet criteria for Parkinson's, right? So it's not an either or, it's very messy. And for a long time, the criteria to diagnose Parkinson's disease required that the person did not have dementia at the time they were diagnosed. But we know 80% of people eventually have dementia and up to a third have mild cognitive impairment when they're first diagnosed. So then 
in the most recent Parkinson's disease criteria change, they took that out. Of course, people with Parkinson's can have dementia, even at the time they're diagnosed. But in the dementia with Lewy body criteria, they kept in that one year rule, meaning if you had slowness, stiffness, or shakiness for a year before you had any of these symptoms, that's not Lewy body. So one is still exclusive of where Parkinson's is more inclusive. Did Robin meet criteria for Parkinson's? Yeah, but he had these other features early enough in his disease course that he qualified as dementia with Lewy bodies. And it's so confusing. Like, why do we do it this way, right? Like we're shooting ourselves in our own foot trying to be so language, you know, um, so OCD about the language and how we use these terms. Are we making it too complex and complicated for people to get what they actually need as well as to make more headway with research? Because again, if we all joined together, and thought about this as a spectrum, rather than our own separate silos, how much more could we get done? But I think that's where your neurologist was coming from in terms of like a complex Lewy body syndrome, right? Yeah, there's Lewy bodies, you know, going back to that algorithm. And what is more prominent in this person? What's more bothersome to them? That should lead to the subcategory, right? but it's kind of one big jumble overall. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. And, and that's usually where I'll use this. Again, this is probably the most <laughs> helpful slide in all this, right? Like the Lewy body diseases includes everybody, but not everybody with a Lewy body disease has Lewy body dementia, right? That's this branch point here. But then some people who have Parkinson's disease without dementia will later develop dementia. But I've certainly run into much more stigma and I don't love the term dementia with Lewy bodies, right? Like you're sticking dementia front and center and people don't like that. So I work with a lot of people in my clinic who have dementia with Lewy bodies and they'll either, they'll either tell family and friends that they have Parkinson's because that's more accepted and less stigmatized or they'll say more generally, I have Lewy body. Yeah, so I think that's yeah where people are coming from where they don't like that term dementia front and center, and I don't blame them. Yeah. So the question was about somebody disappointed that they did not do as well on their thinking and memory tests and the neuropsychological assessment as they would like, and is a second opinion warranted? My answer to that, because I'm not a quack, is always yes. <laughs> second opinions are always warranted. I get second opinions. I encourage all my patients to get second opinions. I always want to be wrong. I do. I always want to be wrong. I don't like giving people bad news. Now, the neuropsychological testing can be very operator dependent. It can depend if somebody was having a good or bad day that day. Did they get a good night's sleep or were they up all night worried because they had a big test in the morning? You know, were they um, hungry? Did they have to pee the whole time, right? So there's a lot of other factors in the testing. Um, and there's a quality spectrum too in terms of the neuropsychologists who are PhD doctors who do the testing. Some are wonderful, some maybe not as good, right? So um, the same goes with neurologists. So I think it's never a bad thing to get a second opinion. Now with the neuropsychological testing though, we don't wanna do it too close back to back because there can be some practice effects where even though we don't give you any feedback or, or 
kind of information on how you did in the moment. You can still remember some of the questions and it can kind of change your results. So usually anything more than six months apart is okay. Um, some neuropsychologists don't like repeating the testing um, any more than every 12 months, but never a bad thing to get second opinions. And the reason why we do the neuropsychological testing when people are being worked up for their deep brain stimulation is that if somebody has a little bit of thinking and memory trouble, the surgery can make it worse. And we never want to make people worse, right? So we're very conservative here um, at the university. And if there's any question of the surgery making their thinking and memory worse, we'll usually hold off. Yeah. I think there was one in the back first. Yeah, and Green? Yeah, very good question. So the question was about white matter. Um, <laughs> I'm actually writing a paper right now on what white matter in the visual form of Alzheimer's. And we have a, a resident expert on white matter, Dr. Chris Philly, who's been here um, longer than I have. And he's an expert in the white matter and has for years been saying we're missing a big chunk of the importance of brain function by not paying attention to the white matter and only paying attention to the gray matter. The gray matter is the brain cells, the kind of outer crust of the brain. There's some gray matter deep inside there, especially the basal ganglia, which is where there's more trouble in people with Parkinson's. But the white matter are the wires, the connections between the brain cells where all the signals get sent. White matter is usually where the changes from blood vessel problems happens deep inside the brain. And even though the brain cells are there and trying to do their work and send their signals, their insulation has been damaged. So what happens when the insulation on a wire gets damaged? Shorts out. <laughs> So that's the white matter. And there's much more focus research-wise on the white matter because there's also very special cells that just live in the white matter that kind of clean up and keep everything safe and clean and, and working well that are probably playing a really big role in the development of neurodegenerative conditions like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Really good question. Yeah. Mm hmm Yeah. Mm hmm Yes. <laughs> yep. So the question on multitasking. Yep. Multitasking is a myth. We can only do one thing at a time. <laughs> Some of us are very good at switching very quickly between tasks, but actually our performance decreases the more we try to do at once. So it's much more productive to do one thing well, rather than two or three things poorly. <laughs> but modern life, right? It's like, oh, you got to keep doing it. Got to do a million things at once. But especially for people with Parkinson's, multitasking is even more difficult because of that executive dysfunction. So that ability to shift between those tasks very quickly is impaired. And then also that speed of processing is slower. So I always recommend people focus on one thing at a time. The caveat being that there are some therapies called dual task therapy, usually done with our physical therapists, where they're working on your gait and your balance, but they're also asking you to say the months of the year backwards while you're doing it, right? And there are studies that show when we try to do those both cognitive and physical things at the same time, that the benefits are compounded. That dual task is a little bit more efficient um, and productive for therapies in that way. But otherwise, yeah, not being able to walk and chew gum at the same time, not necessarily a bad thing. We can only do one thing well at once. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow, man, we're, we're like 
we're like science 301 in here today. Yeah, it's not 101, autophagy and sleep. Wow. So, <laughs> so um, I, and did I forget to say sleep in my things? Yeah, I think I did, didn't I? I stopped with the five finger breathing. So the last thing that's so important to keep our brains healthy and to prevent the onset of dementia is sleep. And there's a lot of sleep research that's going on here at the university and elsewhere, um, including our new uh, chief of movement disorders, Dr. Amy Amara, who will be joining us next month here as a sleep researcher in Parkinson's and thinking and memory. But without sleep, our brains can't function. If we go long enough without sleep, we die. Our brain just fails and shuts down irrevocably. And good quality sleep, is vital, not only to the brain's function that next day, but also long-term health and function. And those people who are night owls that say, oh no, I get by you know, on three hours of sleep a night, I pull all nighters, like they'll pay for it eventually. There's no right amount of sleep. That eight hour recommendation is an average the right amount of sleep for any one person is the amount of sleep where they feel well rested when they wake up in the morning. For some people, that's five hours. For some people, that's 12 hours. And that does change with age, right? You know, newborns sleep 22 hours a day, right? And then once we make it into our 70s, 80s, 90s, we might be fine with five hours. So trying to get to that eight hour a night isn't necessarily needed or useful but deep, restful, restorative sleep. Now, some people do it to themselves, right? Where they have a TV in their bedroom and they're watching the news right before they go to bed and they have their cell phone on their bedside table, right? There's things that a lot of us get in our own way with our sleep quality. I would say the most common reason I see young people in my clinic, and young to me is younger than 65, young people in my clinic is sleep. So they think they have Alzheimer's, it's all their sleep. And it's like, well, you know, I've been pulling all-nighters since I was in college. Why is my memory bad now? Because now you're 50 <laughs> and you're not 20. You gotta take care of yourself. So sleep, sleep, sleep. When we're asleep, especially in the deepest phases of sleep, what we call slow wave sleep, which is where if somebody tries to wake you up or your alarm goes off, like you're kind of groggy and it takes you a while to wake up, as opposed to waking up out of REM sleep, which is when we're dreaming, and that's where you wake up very easily and you're like, oh, I was just dreaming about, you know, unicorns, right? But the deep sleep, slow wave sleep, is when our brain restores itself and there are a lot of those very important processes, kind of housekeeping things that are occurring in our brain in slow wave sleep. There's this entire drainage system called the glymphatic system that only opens up in slow wave sleep. And it literally flushes the brain of waste products and kind of resets it. So when people aren't getting that good quality sleep, they're not able to change their oil of their engine every night. So they're trying to run their car on some cruddy old oil. Now, the question of autophagy, which is um, basically eating up bad stuff in the brain, a fancy word for that, that there's a lot of other immune-mediated processes that are happening in that sleep, too, where our immune system is trying to keep everything up and running and, and tidy in there. So sleep is a huge piece, not only to preventing neurological conditions, but also ensuring they are appropriately and best treated when somebody's already living with neurological symptoms. But sleep, absolutely. Every single person in my clinic that walks in the door gets asked about their sleep. Even if it's not the only reason they have memory trouble, it will absolutely play a role. So I think, are we out of time? Yep, okay. I'm happy to stick around and answer a lot more questions <laughs> too. Um, but I think the, the headline being, Louis body dementia is a category. Get your memory checked regularly. And I'm happy to answer any additional questions. Thank you so much for your attention and wonderful questions. <laughs>